Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in an ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so, Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus, and a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. So, after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities. He started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems, and that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts, along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to the five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so, the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they are actually not living out what they say they believe. And so, this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, I'm Pastor Brett. Excited about being with you here today. Uh, pumped about it. I want to welcome you guys online, whoever's watching. Uh, if you watch this a little bit later, man, glad you're connecting with us. It's awesome. Somebody uh, mentioned to me earlier in the earlier service, asked me before uh, we got started, you know, what's going on? Well, the answer to that is everything, right? There's like everything going on. There's all kinds of things going on. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about what's going on in the life of our church uh, at the end a little bit later. Uh, but one particular thing I want to call your attention to is the meeting at 4 o'clock today. And really excited about it because really uh, it, it's all about uh, the future, what's going on in our church and the life of the church, meeting uh, each other's needs, needs as we glorify God and in a sense exercising our spiritual gifts, which totally fits with everything we've been teaching the last few weeks uh, in 1 Corinthians. So really encourage everybody uh, at 4 o'clock, man, all of us, we need to be here at 4 o'clock, catch a vision, break up and see some things that are happening church-wide, some changes we are making uh, that uh, I think will be so beneficial uh, and uh, so helpful and uh, potential changes as well uh, with uh, all of our ministry teams. So really, really excited about that and so many other things going on. But again, you'll hear more about that. I've got a lot to talk to you about today, really probably more in a little conversational way. I probably won't necessarily uh, scream as much as I normally do. And uh, I, I, I want everybody to know, and if, you, if you're new or you know me, if you've been around, I, I do get excited. I do, you know, elevate the volume, okay? That's a nice way of saying it, I guess. Uh, increase the volume a little bit. Uh, and, and it's not any, anything, it just, I just get excited, okay? And so, uh, but today, uh, probably more of a conversational style. We are teaching through 1 Corinthians, and we are arriving now today, if you have your Bible, in chapter 14. So this has taken us a long time. Again, if you're newer to the church, we, we spent all of last year, okay, 22, starting in 1 Corinthians, and teaching this letter from Paul uh, to the church in Corinthians. So, uh, so that's where we're at now. We're in chapter 14. I can't give you a summation, but what I can do is tell you this. It's all about the gospel. And, and, and as Paul teaches and writes instructions to this particular church, he's doing in light or through the lens of the gospel message which was summarized in 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. But we give thanks to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're new here today, if watching online, uh, checking this thing out, checking the God thing out, you know, whatever. Listen, there truly is hope. There's victory. There's peace and joy and comfort in Jesus Christ. Really, that's the only way, man, uh, we're ever going to discover that. And so that's where we launch from every week in our teaching. Now, to, to give you a sort of brief, a very brief summary, the Corinthians essentially were having trouble getting along. Unity was their challenge. That's the whole reason when we watched that bumper a while ago, okay? That's the whole reason, you know, for it. A diversity in their particular congregation was definitely prevalent. And Paul observed evidently there was a bit of, of showboating kind of going on within the context 
of their worship services, when they were getting together. There was really a lack of order that going on. He's addressing really the mishandling of the spiritual gift of tongues, okay, or speaking in another language. And so, now this is a topic that's often misunderstood, I think. Uh, it's something really we don't talk a lot about in our congregation because, and you'll see why in the teaching, uh, it's really a very individual type gift. I know all gifts are, but you'll see that even more today. And I know we don't, again, talk about it a lot in this place. I don't have that gift, okay? And so maybe that's maybe a reason I don't necessarily even talk about it as much. But again, you'll see kind of some of the reasoning, I think, behind some of that in a minute. But I don't know about you, but man, growing up, um, I just, when I heard about it and I was a student, and you'll hear a couple stories next week because we're going to talk about uh, the order and order in church and things like that. But it's basically tongues kind of freaked me out. You know, I don't know if it that kind of thing, you know, freaks you out or if you even... You know, is it, is it awkward for you to talk about with anyone? You know, or you just don't mention it, you know, or whatever. But I want to submit to you today that it's okay. I mean, it's okay to talk about, and it's okay. Obviously, it is a gift, and we want to recognize that today. We're going to teach them through this and understand, come to an understanding that if we truly teach what I think the Bible is saying and what it is truly teaching us, that really it should be something that should unify us instead of dividing us. It has been a topic, I think, uh, especially this last century, you know, in the 1900s when, when uh, it was evident that this gift was, you know, I guess re-emerging, so to speak, okay, historically, that again, it has caused a bit of division. But I want you to understand, I truly believe today, if we will look at this uh, and understand and look at what the Bible says about it, then we will find, I think it will unify us and it's going to be a good, good thing. So let's look at 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at break this up in two or three weeks in this teaching in 14, okay? But we're going to look at the first five verses. It says this, Follow the way of love and gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, I want to go back just a second, remind everybody of last week. You might not have been here. We talked about love, okay? It's the love chapter, chapter 13, all right? Talking about this is the greatest thing that we possibly really can do. Love God first, love others, okay? The greatest love act that ever made when God created us, right? He created us in His image. And then when we messed up, He gave us a way back to come back into relationship with Him. And I'd say that's love, right? And if, if anybody knows, you know, when you, your kids mess up and you forgive them, it's just beautiful. We do that, right, because of love. And that's what Jesus Christ, you know, did on the cross. It was God's fulfillment of true love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's beautiful, isn't it? But then we see then a, the ultimate love, all right, uh, in a sense, 1 John 3, 16, that we know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down then our lives for the brethren. So that's where we learn love, what Jesus did on the cross. So I am too to love other people just like Him. I am be willing then to lay down my life. Are you willing? You know, Am I willing to lay my life down for you? You for me? You for the person across the aisle? Whomever that would be? Then we've got the concept of forgiveness. The concept of forgiveness. So we receive from Christ the greatest, I think, expression of love, of unconditional love, when we do forgive. For the word of the cross is foolishness, 
to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The world sees it as foolishness. How in the world could these people forgive? Forgive one another. Well, it's through the power of the cross, right? And then John 13, 35 sums it up. By this all people will know that you're my disciples. People are watching you and I, right? If you have love for one another. It's so key because he says that right out the chute here in chapter 14. He's connecting 13 with 14. He's connecting this aspect in 12 of gifts with love, and now with further explanation on how that should be expressed, he says in verse 1, follow the way of love and gifts. Follow the way of love. Question is, first of all, is my heart right with God? Am I right with Him? If I will get right with Him, right before God, then when I see and hear this word from God, then I can you know, mash through it, you know, let it work in me, think about it, meditate on it, dwell on it right for a while, and then let me live it out, determining my theology, determining my practice, whatever about me. It's with me getting right before God. If I'm harboring something in my heart, it is keeping me away, right, from really truly grasping what He has for me. So I know that's a big introduction, all right, okay? And I'll try to move on through the text and get, we'll try to get through this. But that's really where it all comes from. A right heart, you see, with God. A love, a true unconditional love expressed then to God and for those around me. So let's look at these, this text then. And the, the simplest way for me as I was preparing this to have a conversation with you guys about this, with those of you watching online, is simply this. There are questions to answer from this text. These are just questions. As I did preparation, I wrote these questions down. Okay, this is what I need to answer. If I'm going to preach this passage, these are questions I need to answer. So I thought I'd just share my notes with you, essentially. That's what I'm doing this morning. And I would encourage you as well, take some notes. Man, write something down. Just get your phone out, click notes in your phone. I love to do that. Wherever I'm at, when I hear somebody sharing something, there's always something for me, okay? And whether you do it formally in the app, we also have the app with the full-blown notes, or whether you have a handout, whether you have a, you know, you just want to write in the margins of your Bible, whatever, okay? Wherever. Listen, take a note and see what God has to say this morning. Questions to answer from our text. Number one, the first question I had for, for me to study out, what's the gift of prophecy? Because really it's just more, just as much more and more about prophecy in this passage than it is gifts. Look at verse one again, follow the way of love and gifts. He doesn't mention tongues first, he mentions prophecy, okay? Especially the gift of prophecy. So I'm going, what is that? What is prophecy. We defined it a week ago or several weeks ago, excuse me, when we taught in chapter 12. Prophets or spokesmen for God whose messages came immediately from God by the Spirit. Okay, The early church now didn't have the written word yet. They didn't have this yet. Okay, So prophets were inspired to speak what God wanted others to hear. And so it's a linear form of communication. It's a word received from God, delivered then to other people, from God for the people. So if you're taking notes this morning, prophecy is a person speaking the voice of God. It's as if God were actually speaking to you individually. That's what a prophet would do, okay? So the examples in Scripture we'd see is John the Baptist. I think an example in the New Testament is he proclaimed God's message from the Old Testament to those all around him, saying what the Old Testament had said was actually happening right then, right? The Messiah is here. It's time. You need to know this. And John the Baptist was that messenger. There's also an example in Acts, I believe, chapter 21. Abagus, when he was speaking to Paul, when Paul was getting ready to go to Jerusalem, he said, dude, you're going to have some trouble 
when you get to Jerusalem. So that was an example, again, of a prophet letting him know what was going to happen. Simeon and Anna in Luke chapter 2, a prophet, prophetess, and their dealings with Jesus, I'm sorry, with, with uh, uh, Joseph and Mary, okay? And so you can understand and see then what a prophet, a prophetess would have been doing. And if you write those down, go back and read them again. That's what, where I am gathering, okay? Gathering information, gra- gathering teaching so I could do this correctly, okay? But for today, we have God's Word. So we might say today, if someone is impacted by God's Word, wants to share that with people, particularly things that might affect our future, we might say that is a type of prophecy. So it's like a restating, essentially, of the Word of God. Maybe even, I I was thinking, maybe a a modern-day prophet might be somebody Like, I would say kind of like Todd in a way. Todd teaches on Tuesday nights about what's coming in Revelation. The coming, what is happening is he's giving people warning, letting people know this is what the Word of God has said about things that are going to happen in the future, okay? So whatever then is said, and there's a million, I told you a million times not to exaggerate, right? there's There's a lot of prophets or so-called prophets on you know youtube or you watch them online whatever all the time but we have to weigh what people say against what the word of god says okay see the word is not to be added to or taken away from so there's not a new word from the lord it has been said it's an affirmation of what the lord god has said. Now let me give you a scriptural backing for that. It's Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. So I'm not to add anything to it. There's no new word. No new word, okay? God can speak to me through his word and then I can share something with someone, but it is always scripture. It's always, this is the voice of God. Do you see it? Okay. And then it says, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described again in this book. So I'm not to add to, not to take away. This is the voice of God then for you and I. Now we also need to examine what we are being taught. We need to examine the scriptures. We need to examine and scrutinize kind of what's going on. I told the folks earlier, this is a great responsibility what I'm doing today. And I'm going to be held more accountable for my preparation of my teaching, which is even being recorded and shown all over the world. Because I know there's so many people watching today, right? You know, not, okay? But anyway, it's recorded. It's there. And so i got to understand it's very, very important. It's so important. But it's not just me. You as well, as a follower of Christ, are going to be held. Held accountable for what you believe and for what you teach and what you discern. Okay? What you live out. What you believe about things. And this is addressed in Acts 17, okay? Because we need to examine, we've always heard it said, and I've heard, you've heard of the Berean church. Well, the Berean church is a very real church. Why are they so famous? Why do we you know, hear about that? Why don't we talk about it? Because they were, they were on target, okay? Look at Acts 17. These Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. Okay, so I need to receive it, right? And they examined the scriptures daily to see if those things were true. Okay, so, so today, like, you know, if I take notes, I under, I, I'm kind of getting, so it's my job then to go back in my own time, right? And say, hmm, okay, let me read through this, let me read through that. Oh, I see that, oh, I see that. And you determine then personally, you know, what's going on? You determine personally, say, God, you're leading me in this way. You're giving me direction about what I believe, what, the way I think, you know, what I act on, what I do, my giftness, etc. You're leading me to, to let me know which local body of Christ, because there's a lot of them, right, to lock arms with, right? 
You're going to lead me to that church that I get so pumped about, right? To, to find out what my giftedness is and use it then to build up the body of Christ, right? So that's what that's about, okay? One more scripture I want to call your attention to is Hebrews 1 in this little section. Long ago, the writer says, at many times and many ways, God spoke to our fathers, how? By the prophets, okay, through prophecy. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, by his son. We have his son's words. They're right here. This is the word of God. This is Jesus' words for us. Okay? So I don't need another new word from anybody. I don't need to hear that. So as I define what prophecy is, understanding that this is the prophetic word of God. And so I need to memorize it. You know, I need to, to, to obviously read it, meditate on it, think about it all the time. And then live it out as God is leading me and instructing me in my way of life, okay? So the gift of prophecy, you know, to understand again what the Old Testament prophets saw in the future, what they really couldn't wait for in their life, we can now look back on with absolute certainty. I can look, in fact, in our small group, I am so pumped. Is any of my group still here? I think some of them might be, but... To, we're, we're in Daniel in our small group, and we just got through chapter 6. We're getting ready to, to get into, man, the prophetic part of Daniel. I get so excited about those numbers, okay? We're talking about, I mean, actual numbers that have been fulfilled, we see, and that are going to be fulfilled as we get into the 70th week. Todd, it just, I just get so pumped about it, right? I mean, it's just so exciting, man. You know, and so you go into this and you, you understand that you've seen so many things that have happened that I can be certain about knowing that I'm sorry, I'm getting loud again. I'm getting excited. Anyway, and so but but, you know, as, as we know and read these things, there's some of these things that haven't happened yet, but we know they're going to. It's amazing. OK. All right. Quickly. I'm just on number one. Let's go to number two. Here we go. We'll make this a little faster. What exactly is the gift of tongues? What does that mean? Okay, it's a gift, first of all. It comes from God. It's, it's nothing that you can make somebody do or, you know, lead somebody to. Because you don't see that anywhere really in Scripture. You don't, okay? But it's a gift given to people by God. The gift of tongues, it allows a person to speak in a language, listen, in which he or she doesn't know. A language in which nobody knows. They haven't studied. They haven't prepared to speak. I wish I could actually get this. You know, honestly, when I go down to Mexico, I don't have the gift of tongues. I wish I could have the gift of this language, right? I, and I don't. It's never come upon me to do that. But to speak a language in which I have never studied for or prepared for. Do you see it? So if you're taking notes, tongues means this. Dialect or language. It's always a dialect or a, a form of a language, right? Or a language itself. Number three, why is Paul teaching this? Why is Paul taking the time to teach this? Verses four and five, I think, really tell us, okay? Verses four and five, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. So if you're taking notes, this is it. Why is Paul teaching this? The Corinthians needed to unify and know specifically how to build up the church. To build up the church. How do we spend our time when we're together building up the church? I think what it is an example of to me, what he is showing them is you're showing self-exaltation versus lifting up the whole team. And that's what was going on with the Corinthians. I called it showboating a little bit earlier, okay? And people were, were taking this gift and, and, and you know magnifying it more than what was needed to be what needed to be magnified to build up the body and that's what Paul 
was calling attention to. It's very interesting. My dad, he loves to play guitar. He, he's, he's 90 years old, and he's been in a lot of little groups over the years, and uh, little groups that he plays with, you know. And uh, he, he, was in, he was telling me about one group that he was in, that there was a fella in the group that, that uh, just kept wanting to turn up his amp. They all have amps, you know. And so you don't have control over somebody else's sound, right? And so one dude is playing guitar, was all fired up, and he, obviously he just couldn't hear. All right, so, so he was probably turning up the amp so he could hear himself play, and it was just very, it, it just was overpowering, you know, the group. And so because of that, unfortunately, it kind of broke the group up. There was some division, you see, in that little band because one person wanted to hear themselves, you know, above all the others. And I'm just wondering, you know, again, to me, that is a great picture of what the church really is. If I come into together and getting instruction to say one gift is one I should emphasize more than the other, then we take the other gift, right, that is less emphatic, and we, we, it's a lesser thing, and so we don't do it as much as why we don't talk about it. You'll hear about that even more in a moment. But it's like an orchestra. I used to play in band and I played instrument. It was awesome. I, I just loved getting together, especially in an orchestra situation, because it was so wonderful how, how everything just worked together to create, you know, the sound that, that, that everything wanted to, wanted to be created. And there was a specific way. You have signs all over the, the page in music, you know, these little, little lettering signs telling you when to play soft, when you need to play louder, et cetera, all these kinds of things. And it's just really, really beautiful. But it's kind of like that, okay? It's like, and I was in groups too, that somebody just played way too loud. You're like, man, you know, tone it down. And the director would be saying, man, you know, hold back you know, just a little bit. Those kinds of things. I actually was looking at this up, and I it found it interesting that symphony orchestra, actually symphony means, in modern language, it's like taking multiple uh, uh, parts of music and putting them together. It's like four or five pieces of music together. So the symphony orchestra gets together and plays multiple songs, for the lack of a, a better way to say it, okay? But actually the word symphony, you know what it means in the original, like in a Greek language, and its Greek meaning means agreement of sound. Agreement of sound. I found that very fascinating to me. What an application for a local church. What if we had an agreement of sound, an order to what we're doing, the way God intended it? And that is what Paul is calling the Corinthians to do. He's saying, listen, you need to understand this, that, that because of this, we need to build up the church. It is not about these guys that want to crank their amp, right? It's about the ones and building all of us up for all for the glory of God, okay? Quickly, number four, who is the object of tongues? The object of tongues. This is very, very clear, very, very plain. Who's the object of tongues? Verse two, for anyone who speaks in a tongue, listen, does not speak to men, but to God. Anyone who speaks in a tongue, in a different language, does not speak to men, but to God. Okay, if you're taking notes, when believers speak in tongues, God is the recipient. God is the recipient of the tongues. Look at the direction of the conversation, right? Upward, not sideways. It's vertical. It's not horizontal. It's toward God. It's not towards Men. So tongues aren't messages to men and women. They are messages to God and for His glory. Tongues and their interpretations then should reflect praises to God and lifting God. Listen, not messages to the congregation. Messages to the congregation are called prophecies. Are you connecting this morning? Do you understand? Do you see the difference of what Scripture is telling us? Let's look then at when tongues was born, we saw it again when the Spirit of God came down the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Let's look at this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Other languages, right? So now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They had come there for the day of Pentecost. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Listen, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. They're declaring the wonders of God. Do you see it? The wonders of God. Now let's look at another place, Acts 10. Cornelius had brought some folks together, some, some non-Jews. Or they're there in the house. Uh, Peter had just shared the gospel message essentially uh, in a real quick way, but from, say, Genesis to Revelation. I mean, it's just a quick, quick way to, to, to uh, share the gospel. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. There it is. Praising God. Declaring the wonders of God. Praising God. Now let's look at 14, 16, and 17 in 1 Corinthians. If you are praising God with your spirit, how could one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. So what we have here is declaring the wonders of God, praising God. We see praising God again. We see thanksgiving. We see thanks. And so I would come to this conclusion. Tongues, if you're taking notes, always incorporates praise and or prayer. Praise and or prayer. Now check this out. In 1 Corinthians 6, 17, we've already studied this several weeks ago, months ago. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. We taught this too a few weeks ago. When, when you're united with God, we believe you are, when you're born again, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, taught on that weeks ago. You can go listen to that. You know, Go on YouTube and go find it, okay? But this verse affirms that he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now, check out verse 2 again in our text. It says that he utter, utters mysteries with his spirit. Are you tracking with me? That he utters mysteries with his spirit. So if I'm united with the Holy Spirit and I've been given this gift in speaking in tongues, my spirit again is united with him. So the spirit has something to do with this. And if someone is speaking in tongues, he or she may be praising or praying. We're connected, you see, to the Holy Spirit. We are one. And maybe that's why a person praying in tongues doesn't know the language because of the connectedness of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting to note, nowhere in the Bible, okay, nowhere are we taught on how to pray in this way. Jesus never taught on it. We, we don't see any teaching on it. Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, and there was nothing in his teaching about praying in tongues. So tongues, this is what I'm, I'm coming up with as we study this, tongues must be mostly for the individual and not the church as God grants the gift. I don't seek the gift out. God simply grants you this gift. He gives you this gift, right? And it says again, and we'll address this next week, unless there's an interpreter, okay? We'll talk about that. But again, in fact, the Acts 2 text, tongues was a sign, okay? The sign to the unaware world that the Messiah had come. There was not an interpretation of the tongues. Did you notice that? There's no interpreter in Acts 2 because they heard the language in their own dialect, in their own tongue. They knew what they were saying, right? And the message was, it was glorifying God, the Bible says. It was affirming, right, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so that is what they heard. And in Acts 10 text, the world has shown that the Spirit is for all believers, not just the Jews. But there was interpretations in that case, listen, 
through prophecy. Again, separating prophecy from tongues as a message to the church. Acts 2, let's look at the text, 14 through 17. Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet, there it is, Joel, in the last days and so on and so forth. He explains it. Prophecy is different, you see, than a message received by the speaking of tongues. Prophecy led to sharing the gospel, leading to many salvations. The same thing happened with Cornelius and Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. I know this, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by The Word of God. That's faith. That's faith building. That's how we hear the Word. It's not through a message through tongues, okay? I'm not saying God couldn't use it in in an evangelistic way. I'm not saying that that couldn't happen anywhere, okay? I'm never to limit God, but according to what He has said, it is said very, very clearly. We are going to hear that message of salvation right through the tongue in which we understand okay number five is it then okay to build up myself this is an interesting question in verse four there's been people say well then you know we can't build ourselves up no it's not about self-exaltation but i obviously got to be working on building myself up in verse four it says he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself all right but he's talking about he who prophesies edifies the church So we need to lift up the church and not build up ourselves. We need to all be built up, encouraged, challenged, etc. However, it's not as important as building up the church in the the big setting, in the corporate setting. Too many times we come to to a gathering, listen, trying to discover what's in it for me. I'm coming in here and I go, what's in it for me, right? Uh, Do I like the songs that Kyle chose today? All right? Was it the was it the right, you know, sound that I wanted? How was the pastor? Was he too loud? You know, I can't stand that loud guys, you know, or whatever, okay? And we determine that instead, okay? Uh, we we start looking at me instead of what God wants to say and do into the whole body all for his glory. We come together today so that we can build each other up, all right, and encourage one another, exercising our gifts all for God's glory. And in the meantime, somehow, man, I'm going to be built up. It's going to build me up. When you're using your gift of encouragement, what are you going to do? You're building me up, right? But I am not doing it for myself. Again, he is making comparison in this case that these folks who were doing this were doing that. And so that's why he's teaching on this particular topic. Number six, what's in the deal with greater gifts in verse five? Okay, verse five. Well, we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given. All of us are given a gift, right, or multiple gifts for the common good. Common good. So all gifts are made then to right to build up in essentially one another. But we look at this, the gift isn't, it really isn't a greater or lesser gift. It's the correct application of the gift that really matters. The gifts are all there. It's how am I using my gift as God leads? Am I using it in the way that God would instruct me to? Or am I using it then? For myself. He's simply stating the gift of prophecy builds others up, and the gift of tongues, listen, edifies the self. And then that certainly then could be a way that we keep then to ourselves most of the time. And again, we'll address then the order of worship and what that looks like next week. The worship team wants to come on up. So, what we do then in this place glorifies God and it builds up the body. Okay? So if there's someone who isn't a part of the body, even here today, hopefully you've observed 
and you observe people using their spiritual gifts to lift up. You see love, right? And because of that, we've seen, you've seen also people glorifying God in a very authentic way. And when you see and hear that as God speaks to your heart through the Word of God, you might be called then to a relationship with Him. And as we do the same and heed one another's gifts and glorify God, we ask ourselves as believers, what is the next step that I need to take in my spiritual walk? And so that is the invitation today. If you don't know Christ, man, say yes to Him. If you're watching, say yes to Him, right? And, and if you're already tight with the Lord and moving, listen, we all have a next step. Let's discover what that is and seek Him out on it and be careful to give Him all the glory, honor, and praise. God, we're so grateful that you love us, so thankful you've given us purpose. And I pray, God, that you would, as we follow up with this, uh, this time, that we would take the next step of obedience and whatever that may be, and may you be glorified in it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Let's answer the call of God today. Let's be obedient.